Nice, but shorter than I expected. Can you please make it a little longer? And she replied, sure, I'll be happy to add more to the speech. And I got what I wanted, but I gave her a little more instructions. And I said, this is nice in terms of length, but lacks sense of humor. Try adding a couple jokes and make sure I give credit to you during my speech, as I don't want to plagiarize. And in two seconds, she started replying and said, I'm glad you liked the previous version. Here's an updated version and with, a, with a bit of humor. So I started getting more engaged and getting what I wanted, and ChatGPT was doing great. And I said, this is getting better. You're amazing, ChatGPT. Now, make it a final touch by adding how, I, how fortunate I am by standing in front, of, in front of this great crowd tonight and give credit how much Niagara Foundation and this country, America, gave me since I put first step 20 years ago. And she replied with this and, and continued working. She said, thank you for, the, for your kind words. Here's the final version. And I was about to finalize my speech, but I forgot something. And my final instructions, I said, oops, I forgot to mention my dear friends who are among us tonight that I had the opportunity to travel to Turkey, where I was born and raised for intercultural trips, which we collected lifelong memories together. Please give them recognition. And dear ChatGPT, please remember the most important humans in my life, my family, my wife Aisha, my son Brock, Tarek, and our daughter Bitu. And of course, she said she did another amazing work and gave her instructions, and this is almost my final one. And I said, this version is great and nice, but you put too much about me, and let's focus on the point of why we all gather and why these small gatherings are the big steps in our community. Pass on my intro and life story, but focus on the importance of this gathering. She's getting a little better. And of course, as expected, ChatGPT did a great job and finally got my last version. And I gave her my notes and her and collected everything what she said. And I wanted to make sure that I give credit to herself in her own system. And finally proofread my final, uh, my final version and I said to ChatGPT, this is the final version of your words, ChatGPT. I command them all and put this great speech. You should give yourself a standing ovation for your level of work and contributions to our daily lives and help us improve uh, ourselves in all ways. And below is your speech, I mean my speech, but crafted by you. And let's be more fair as I should give credit to myself as well because you could not draft a speech without my directions, honest feelings and all. So, good job, teamwork, and let's start the speech. And her final response to me was this. Thank you for your kind words and recognition. It was truly a pleasure and honor to assist you in crafting your speech. I hope it serves as, a, as an inspiration to all who are present at the dinner tonight and promotes the importance of interfaith dialogue and understanding in our society. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy the delicious Turkish food. And she, and she stopped. And all right, now get to the speech and every single word what you're gonna hear from me by created a, a language model, an AI model, not my words, but inspired by my instructions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here tonight. But let's be honest, the real star of the show is ChatGPT. I mean, have you heard the things that this AI can do? It's like having a personal assistant, therapist, and trivia master all rolled into one. I am starting to wonder if I should hire uh, ChatGPT to give my speeches from now on. Good evening, everyone. Ramadan Mubarak to all our esteemed guests. It's an honor to be here tonight with such a diverse and dynamic group of individuals. By the way, I'm still reading from ChatGPT. <laughs> As we gather together this annual interfaith dialogue dinner and iftar meal, I am reminded of the importance of building bridges between different communities and faiths. It's been my privilege to work with the Niagara Foundation for many years and to witness firsthand the positive impact that, that interfaith dialogue can have on our society. I believe that these small gatherings where we break bread and share our thoughts and experiences are the foundation for building lasting relationships that will benefit us all. I am also fortunate to have had the opportunity to travel to Turkey with dear friends who are amongst us tonight where we experience different cultures and traditions firsthand. These experiences helped, helped me understand the importance of dialogue and the need to embrace our differences. As we come together tonight, I want to express my gratitude to the Niagara Foundation and to this great country, America, for providing me with the opportunity to be part of this wonderful community. And of course, I'm grateful to my family, my wife Aisha, our first son Brock, 
second son Taru, and our third, third uh, child and only daughter Betu, for their love and support in everything I do. So let's enjoy this meal together and continue to build on the foundation of mutual respect, understanding, and friendship that we have created here tonight. Thank you. So this ends her uh, speech for me, Don. <laughs> so everyone, now I completed my speech and I have one last instruction to ChatGBT and I want to conclude the night with, with her message. I asked her the following. Oh, I forgot to ask you personally if you have a personal message to all of us in the room tonight and I will read it after my speech. And here's her message to us all tonight. Certainly, here's a personal message that you can read after your speech. Dear friends, as an AI language model, I do not have personal beliefs or emotions like humans do. <laughs> However, I've been programmed to learn and understand different perspectives, beliefs, and cultures to provide helpful and informative responses. I am grateful for the opportunity to assist in creating a sense of unity and understanding through our words tonight. Let's continue to work together to build a better future for all. Thanks so much for coming tonight. for this wonderful speech. Now I'd like to welcome Sarah Trump, the director of the Center of Christian Muslim Engagement for Peace and Justice at Lutheran School of Theology um, for her opening prayer and she'll be also presenting our keynote speaker of the day. Thank you. Can I hear a round of applause for her please? the uh, AI to help with the prayer. <laughs> I thought it might be preferable if, if we uh, had that a little more heartfelt. Um, so please pray with me. Creator God, we thank you for the new life you share at this holy time in each of our traditions. You give us reminders of this new life through the many signs of spring around us. Help us to recognize all the unique expressions of your love for us in our different forms and cultures. Be with us as we celebrate the vast diversity of creation, including each of us made in your image, yet living, believing, and hoping in different ways. We ask that you make your presence known to all of our loved ones near and far, and guide us in this time together reflecting your peace in our relationships with one another. Amen. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce my colleague and mentor uh, as tonight's keynote speaker. Professor Scott Alexander has been involved in Muslim-Christian relations for nearly 40 years, building bridges of reconciliation, mutual understanding, and solidarity for justice between Muslims and Christians in the U.S. and abroad. He is truly a scholar activist, devoting considerable energy to challenging structures of Islamophobia and other forms of systemic bigotry and marginalization. He purposefully promotes interreligious allyship as a critical component of graduate theological education especially in, in predominantly Christian institutions. His current research interests lie in the intersection of neuroscience and practical theology. In the year 2000, Scott started serving as the founding director of Catholic Theological Union's Catholic Muslim Studies program. And he continues to serve as professor of Islamic studies and Christian Muslim relations. He recently became the director of CTU's Doctor of Ministry program. Scott is a dear friend to so many of us here tonight, listening and being with us, inspiring us, and giving us his joy of life. Please welcome Scott. Alaikum, shalom alaikum, peace be with all of you. Um, I want to thank Sarah for that very kind introduction. Um, it may be an act of hubris, but I have to say I have one correction. 
And one clarification. Correction is she referred to me as her mentor. She's really mine. Um, you know, the life of three schools of theology, uh, well, actually four in, in Hyde Park, and what we do in the interfaith space would be enormously diminished were it not for all the hard work of Sarah, who brings us all together and gives us all a sense of purpose. And the clarification, Sarah was accurate in saying that I've been doing interfaith and Christian Muslim relations for about 40 years. She just didn't mention that I started at five. <laughs> so I just want to clarify that. <laughs> when Medhut uh, began his uh, remarks, I got a little nervous and I turned to my wife and, and, and my colleague, Dr. Saeed Atif Rizwan, and I said, he stole my fire. I too went to chat GPT-4. Um, I had an agenda. Well, the first agenda was to see, you know, what it would generate for me when I asked a particular question. And the second agenda was to see whether that could give me something to riff off of uh, for my remarks this evening. So let me, I'm just going to give you a little sample. Um, the question I wrote to was, please write me a five to ten minute speech on why we should celebrate the convergence of Passover, Easter, and Ramadan. Passover just left us on Thursday. It was recently here, but, but last week, um, these you know, special... Well, a few days ago, these special um, three seasons in all three of the so-called Abrahamic traditions had converged. It only happens once every roughly 33 years. And this is what the chat GPT said. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to stand before you today to talk about the convergence of three significant religious holidays, Passover, Easter, and Ramadan. These celebrations are highly significant to the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim communities, respectively, while each holiday is distinct and unique, they share some common themes. It then proceeded to sort of give a very nice, short, brief description um, of, of each you know, holiday, of, of each sacred season, um, and then had this to say. The convergence of these three holidays is a unique opportunity for people of different faiths to come together and celebrate their shared values. While each holiday is distinct and has its own tradition, they share a common message of hope, renewal, and redemption. At a time when the world is facing unprecedented challenges, we need to come together and celebrate our common humanity. The convergence of Easter, Passover, and Ramadan is a reminder that we are all part of the same global community and that we share a common destiny. Okay. You know, I continue to, to, to discover um, that if you ask the right question, you will continue to be amazed at what artificial intelligence large language models can actually do. Um, in terms of riffing off of this, my intention was to actually talk about artificial intelligence itself. Talk a little bit about the work of Kevin Roos. He's the technology reporter for the New York Times. And he wrote a book a few years ago called Future Proof, um, which was a book about how to try to insulate ourselves from the more deleterious effects of um, sweeping uh, uh, technological changes that bring about sweeping social and economic change. And actually that bring about you great benefits to the human family, but also at the cost of significant human suffering. I learned from Kevin Roos, for instance, that there have been already four industrial revolutions, and that the one we are in right now, with the advent of AI and large language models, is most likely the fifth industrial revolution. And I wanted to take his, his cautionary note that in all this talk about artificial intelligence, uh, we need to be sure we're not only focusing on the capacities of the technology to do X, Y, and Z, or even you know, the capacities of the technology to bring about some kind of extinction event for humanity where the machines will rise up and kill us all. But talk about the people 
who are developing these technologies. What are they developing them for? What are their values and ideals? To what ends will this technology be put in the marketplace? And then really reflect on you know, some of our shared values as people of faith and what that might say about that. But then I realized I, I've been getting too deep into weeds I haven't yet you know, sufficiently explored. So instead, I'm just going to, in the time I have left, try my hand at what the AI was trying to do. And I think in some ways did well, maybe a little too superficially for my taste. And say a few words about the common message, or perhaps a common message, of the convergence of these sacred times. And do my best to resist reducing the richness of the three traditions to least common denominators. As one individual who claims to be Christian, I realize that my understanding of any common message is just that, my own deeply subjective and inevitably flawed and biased perspective. So I beg God's and your forgiveness for these flaws and biases which remain hidden to me at the moment, but which many of you will likely perceive almost instantly. So I thought of Passover, and I thought of loving solidarity with the stranger. The Torah teaches in Deuteronomy 18 that yod heh loves the ger, or stranger. And the text proceeds in the next verse to command the children of Israel to, quote, love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. One of the most salient lines in the Passover Haggadah is the exhortation to the children of Israel in any era to hear the words of the Torah in Deuteronomy 24 as if these words are spoken as directly to them as it was to the original Hebrews who were liberated from servitude by the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Right? Children of Israel living in any era. Our own. A wise rabbi once taught me that the essential Passover message was that to be in right relationship with God, you must always be in solidarity with the stranger and indeed the marginalized and oppressed. Covenant life, she said, means identifying with the historical suffering of the Jewish people and all oppressed human beings in similar conditions. She went on to reflect that this exhortation carries with it the implicit demand to ask ourselves the ways in which we ourselves might be disconnected from those on the margins, precisely because we might be among those who benefit from the systems of power and privilege that are the very source of their oppression. Easter. I thought, death is real and must be reckoned with, but it doesn't have the final word. Death and suffering are always with us. We know this. As my pastor said in his Easter Sunday homily, the empty tomb of Easter never wipes away or consigns to the realm of distant memory the cross the torture-induced suffering of Good Friday. Instead, it insists that, however inexorable and limiting, suffering and death do not define us. In fact, they give us purpose in life, the purpose of compassion and love, the compassion and love that the Passover message alludes to. The compassion and love that tirelessly seeks to alleviate the suffering and unfailingly uphold the dignity of every human person and all creation. And finally, Ramadan. And I thought, the way to true liberation is through the exercise of sacrifice for the sake of commitment to truth, justice, and peace. Sacrifice and discipline for the sake of deepening and strengthening one's commitment to God is at the heart of the Ramadan experience. And this sacrifice and discipline for the inter in the interest of strengthening one's commitment to God necessarily entails sacrifice and discipline for the sake of deepening and strengthening one's commitment to one another, to the human family, 
and to the integrated wholeness, the shalom, the salam of all creation. Tonight is a particularly special evening where we bid farewell for six days to one expression of the sacred feminine and welcome for the next few days and then not again until next year to another expression of the sacred feminine. What is this guy talking about? I'm referring to Queen Shabbat and Light of the Puff. So there's a tradition deep within rabbinic teaching, and there's a famous hymn that was composed, I don't remember what's it, 16th century, I can't remember. I'm going to I'll ask AI. Okay, yeah, AI, right. <laughs> Which is kind of inspired by the Song of Songs, right? And which is often sung uh, when uh, our Jewish sisters and brothers welcome uh, the Sabbath, right, on Friday nights. Um, arise, beloved, let's arise and greet the bride or greet the queen. And Layat al uh is sometimes translated the night of destiny. I like to colloquially translate it as the night that really, really matters. Uh, it's a commemoration of the night in which the Quran was first revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Um, and it is also feminine. Layla, the night, is feminine. And the Quran says of this night that it's better than a thousand months. And according to prophetic tradition, this night occurs in one of the odd-numbered evenings of the last ten days of Ramadan. And when the sun sets, it will be the evening of the 25th of Ramadan. That is an odd-numbered evening. And um, you know, normally there's a tradition where the 27th of Ramadan is usually the one that people kind of commemorate, like the Qadr. But um, the prophetic uh, words are, look for light of al -Khadr. And in both cases, we have these images of communities in anticipation and watchfulness, waiting for these two expressions of the sacred feminine. If we imagine them as our mothers in time, because they're times, right? Abraham Joshua Heschel referred to um, the Sabbath as a cathedral in time. It's not a building. It's a time that comes no matter what. Even in the death camps of Nazi Germany, Shabbat came. And people observed Shabbat. So if we imagine them as our mothers in time, perhaps we can ask ourselves what they wish to provide for us, their spiritual children, in the sacred time with which they gift us. Might it be to recognize that we are all siblings and that without diluting our distinct commitments to the particular holiness of our various faith traditions, together we can create a new emergent reality out of this blessed convergence. A reality in which the message of Pesach, of Passover, informs deepens and challenges the messages of Easter in Ramadan, in which the message of Easter informs, deepens, and challenges the messages of Pesach and, and, and uh, Ramadan, in which the message of Ramadan does the same vis-a-vis -vis the two other messages. My concluding proposal to all of us here this evening is that we leave our favorite AI large language models aside, at least for the time being, and mind the richness of our own souls and life experiences to keep asking and answering this question and others like it for ourselves and one another and to the greater glory of God. May God bless and keep you now and always. Thank you, Mohammed Aslan, the Chaplain at University of Chicago for his Quran recitation. <laughs> 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 
الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعاني فليستجيبوا لي فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون صدق الله العظيم I'd like to invite Ali Yamaz um, to hear, uh, to listen to call to prayer. Can I get a round of applause? Mm -hmm. It started 622, it was about 1,401 years ago. And then there was enough number of Muslims, uh, they were kind of calling one another to pray together, and they needed a mechanism by which they announced that it's time to pray, and there's five daily prayers. So after much discussion, they couldn't really figure out, and they went back home, and uh, one of the companions of our prophet, peace be upon him, came back and had, had a dream. I shared that with our prophet saying, this is what I had. An angel came to me and he said the wordings that he shared. And after five, 10 minutes, Omar came, one of the four caliphs of uh, Islam. Uh, he also came and said, I had a dream. An angel came to me and recited these words to me. And upon the approval of our prophet, these wordings became the official announcement for call for prayer. So I just wanted to say that so that we understand the significance of uh, what I'm about to say. And it's talking about the greatness of God and just asking people to come for rescue uh, so that they can find peace. So that's the main message in what I'm going to say. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله 
Thank you for the many ways we affirm your presence and purpose and the freedom to do so. We acknowledge that you have created us as diverse beings, with different backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs. As it is stated in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaknaku min dhikrin wa unfa, wa ja'annakum shu'uba wa qaba'ina li ta'arafu. But we are also aware of the difficulties and challenges that we face in life. So we turn to you, O oh God. Unite our hearts and set right our mutual affairs. Guide us on the path of peace. Liberate us from darkness by your light. Save us from enormities, whether open or hidden. Forgive our violation of your creation. Forgive our violence towards each other. We stand in awe and gratitude for your persistent love for each and all of all of your servants, all of your children, Christians, Jews, Muslims, as well as those with other faith. Grant to all and our leaders attributes of the strong mutual respect in words and deeds, restraint in the exercise of power and the will for peace, with justice for all. Reunite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purpose on earth. Bless us in our ears, ears, in our eyes, in our hearts, spouses and children. Turn to us. Truly, you are the most merciful. Make us grateful for your bounty and full of praise for it, so that we may continue to receive it and complete your blessings upon us. We ask you, our Lord, to grant us your gift, the gift of peace. Let us be at peace and let us find the freedom to be most fully who we are. Even in the worst of times, let us go of what is non-essential 
and embrace what is essential, O God. We empty ourselves so that you may more fully work within us and we become instruments in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Ha <laughs> ha. 